Hi, my name is Nathaniel Jones, and I'd like to thank you for joining this webinar, IBIPSA Project One, a new generation of computing tools for building and district energy systems by Michael Wetter. This webinar is hosted by the IBIPSA USA Research Committee with the goal to share new ideas from research to the building simulation community. If you have questions during this webinar, please type them in the chat window. At the end of the 40 minute presentation, I will unmute our audience on Zoom for discussion with Michael. Next slide, please. AIA Continuing Education Credit is available for attending this webinar. Please email info at AIAEV.org with your AIA membership number to receive credit for attending today's event. And now I'd like to introduce Michael Wetter. Thank you. So thank you for the introduction. And in terms of the overview of my talks, I first want to explain why we are doing this collaboration and also where we were about 10 years ago. Afterwards, I'm going to explain the structure of the ABIPSA Project 1, and I'm going to pick selected work that we are doing in ABIPSA Project 1, and also explain then its use in the US. And I want to end the presentation with some outlook of what's next, where I think, what, what are the technologies and uh, developments that we should be focusing on. So why are we doing this collaboration? So there are new requirements on uh, building energy systems. So post by decarbonization, in particular, big, particular decarbonization of heating supply, but also in terms of resilience, grid integration, and opportunities for digitization of uh, uh, building delivery processes. So on the one side on the top left here, there are, for example, new systems for heating and cooling uh, of buildings are appearing. So the schematic that you see here is from a building that's been built in Sweden that uses one water loop near 20 degrees or 22 degrees Celsius, so it's around 70 Fahrenheit. The then provides either heating in a zone, if the zone is below the temperature, or cooling in a zone if the zone temperature raises above this temperature. And so that there's a very efficient uh, operation of these systems where we can have uh, waste heat or excess heat and excess cool being shared among different thermal zones through a, a usual water loop and stabilized then through a heat pump. On the discrete energy system, we are seeing uh, new architectures now for combined discrete heating and cooling system where you have one pipe installed that runs through a district that then can be used as a reservoir uh, to uh, either get heat out of it or get cooling out of it. So you can use that as a reservoir for heating and cooling. You can modularly extend them to build it out in a larger and larger areas. So you don't need to do all the investment a priori. And you can start networking together different loops that may serve different parts of a city. So you can do a waste heat uh, sharing, not only within your loop, but also within city areas. At the same time, there's uh, opportunities for digitization for control delivery. And we're going to talk about that uh, later in more detail, where we are working on a pass to digitize the control delivery that allows us in design to see how efficient those control sequences are. And during uh, operation, we can have a formal verification of the as installed sequences by the commissioning agent. And in between, we can do machine to machine translation to translate sequences from simulation to the native representation on different control platforms. And there's also a need then for building to grid integration where depending on the signal from the grid, you need to operate assets behind the meter differently, such as a, a stationary uh, 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 energy storage, so a battery, for example, or you may operate your PV system somewhat differently depending on the grid signals. So for that, we need to start understanding how we can combine now and uh, a couple models for billing systems and electrical systems to really start optimizing those systems together as an integrated system, as opposed to individual pieces that work in isolation and may start fighting each other during certain times of the day. So we are seeing here that the billing energy systems are really changing. So there are fundamental changes that we are seeing in energy system topologies, but also advances in storage technologies. And storage becomes more and more important as we work toward grid integration. 
controls also becomes much more complex and that there, there are opportunities for digitization of the billing delivery process. But not only those uh, energy technologies for billings are changing, but also software stacks and software development workflows are undergoing fundamental changes. So for example, about 25 years ago, I developed GenOp, then I wrote it from scratch, not using any software package outside of the Java uh, software development kit. If you contrast that now to today's uh, optimization tools like Payomo or Optimica, they integrate a lot of different packages for uh, uh, obtaining uh, derivatives from a cost functions, for solving nonlinear system equations. So software development really became a question of integrating different packages with each other. And of course, everyone knows now about GitHub that we can have shared development processes, which were not even imaginable about 20 or 30 years ago. So there's a really fundamental shift, not only in the building technologies, but also on software and opportunities of how we collaboratively develop such software. So the question is really, what is needed to get the scale from the point of view of this technology? And the way I like to characterize that is that on one side, we need very robust foundational science. So we need to have clear representation and understanding of the mathematics that's involved, the physics, and also the controls, and then have a solid uh, computer science and computer technologies to uh, represent those systems in a way where we can reason about them. We want to do that so robust standard so that uh, we have uh, standardized technologies that we can invest in and that we can share them across different engineering sectors. So not only buildings, but also other sectors that are uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, simulation and model-based uh, product development. So we really need to understand what are those software standards and also what are the hardware standards to run some of those applications to support building operation. And then on the application point of view, so from the mechanical designer point of view, we need plug and play system level design rules so that we can plug and play systems using platforms that embody already and satisfy energy code requirement that allows us then to have standardized workflows and that integrate design and operational tools with each other so that we get away from the one off ad hoc solutions that we often see in today's building industry to the use of platforms that we can customize to our climate, to our availability of renewable energy, whether it's, for example, a lake water integration, or whether it's PV or wind energy, or any other of these technologies. So we want to be able to customize those systems using platforms, combine them, and integrate them into actual energy systems and deploy them through formal processes to the actual uh, uh, construction site. So let me step back of uh, where we were about 10 years ago. So 10, 10, 20 years ago, we basically all developed our own building simulation software, but each had a mutually incompatible uh, model format. The semantic was different in these tools. The software architecture was not incompatible and you could not really take a model, for example, from Trace and run it in Energy Plus or take a model from ESPR and put it into TAS or into virtual environment. So they all were completely different and someone was happily paying for all the development, whether it's a use of a commercial tool or whether it's an investment by, the, by some government that funds uh, the other uh, tool developments. And only really few experts were able to understand what's going on in these tools. The tools were often not transparent and they didn't really uh, satisfy the needs of the users. And about 25 years ago, there was a brilliant recognition by uh, Persalin, Pablo Cosman, Ed Sowells, and others that models could be developed once in a language that's very close to mathematics, stored in a repository, and then exported to simulators. So there was development of a neutral model format, which is now actually still used as part of the I2I software. And there were translators developed that allowed them to use this NMF model and create the type that runs in trances, or create a Spark model, or create a model that runs in Atrexin Plus. So it was, became possible to write the model once, validate it, document it, and share all this development, and then deploy to different uh, building simulation programs. Unfortunately, that effect, uh, effort was stopped by ASHRAE TC 4.7, which uh, thought it was a little bit 
too much ahead of its time. So funding was basically shut down and it did not really take off then as an international open source approach here that I think could really have revolutionized how we develop building simulation software. But that model is still used now in Ada ICE as uh, the, one of the core languages of how models are being expressed in that language. So in absence of a way to exchange models, we started co-simulation. So there was a flurry of uh, co-simulation tools being developed, a couple, for example, Energy Plus with Quantum, or GEMS with Transys, or ESPR could have been coupled to, tra to Transys. So they each had their uh, own uh, interface uh, being developed. There were ad hoc approaches that were done for this one-to-one -one tool couplings. I developed in the building control virtual test pad that was trying to come up with a middleware that can be used to couple all the simulation tools together. But all this effort really looked like a, a nice idea, but it was very hard to get off the ground. There was really a lack of a standard. There was no formal framework in a lot of this coupling employed. And at the same time, as we started developing the building control virtual test bed, there was a significant bigger uh, development happened with the functional mockup interface. So it was a large development effort started with uh, FMI that involved multiple industry sectors. So the question for us is really, how can we leverage all this effort and can start uh, modeling like we're building with Lego? So on one side, we have our substrate. In our case, that are equations that define the physics or that define the, the control logic. We're going to be able to encode them, encapsulate them in reusable building blocks that they can then use and uh, arbitrarily start connecting them together as long as it makes sense from a physics point of view. And so that starts building up systems that can be configured in a fairly flexible way. So similar than with Lego blocks building houses, we want to have these components for heat conduction, for storage, or even higher level components for a chiller or for a whole air handler unit that we can then use to graphically compose whole systems. So for such uh, plug and play modeling and also co-simulation, it turns out that they're actually robust standards that uh, have been developed. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel on that side. So on one side for energy modeling, and modeling in general is the Modelica standard. That's an open industry driven standard for multi-physics modeling that has been developed since about 1996. And as an application example here, about 7% of the German power production is, based, is optimized based on uh, Modelica tools. And for certain applications, you still need domain-specific simulators. And for that, the uh, functional mockup interface standard has been developed. So that's uh, a standard that uh, prescribes how you can expose a simulator so that other tools can interact with it during runtime and synchronize multiple simulators among each other. That is being developed uh, also close to 20 years now, a little bit less than that, and supported by more than 150 tools. So some benefit of these uh, standards are really that it allows them uh, to leverage investments that are done in other industries and also uh, developers of tools and also of uh, workflows. They can invest into these standards because there's a clear defined uh, stable in application programming interface that significantly simplifies software integration. So it's really a stable basis for industry to invest in. And it also avoids vendor locking because there are multiple uh, tool providers who support these standards. So that really led us to the development of the uh, Abipsa Project 1. And originally, the Abipsa Project 1 started as the International Energy Agency uh, EPC Annex 60, so around 2012. And the question was there really of how can we get uh, the community behind those efforts here and start embracing this standardization? And then on a, a walk to lunch together with Jan Hansen, we, we were basically chatting of how to get something like that started. And he proposed to just basically get started with an annex proposal for the International Energy Agency. And that allowed us then to form an international team that then conducted research for about the five years duration under the Annex 60 project. And the core of this team is now coordinating the research under the BIPSA Project 1 that's being led by myself and by Christoph Van Dweck from um, uh, Aachen University. And key principles of this uh, development is that 
everything that we are doing is under the BSD license, so no exceptions. And that was really critical in order not to have to build up barriers here. And uh, everyone provides their own funding, but then we coordinate the work among the, the participants here. And the vision of the project one is really to create the open source software that builds in the basis for next generation computing tools for building and discrete energy systems. So there are focus areas on the discrete energy system. So moving from geoinformation system to discrete energy simulation and then simulation and optimization based on those models. And something similar on the building scale, uh, moving from building information model to uh, HVAC and building envelope models. And then also how to use such models for simulation and again, optimization and analysis. So the structure of the project is such that we are having uh, three main tasks. So in the first task, we are developing technologies for simulation and optimization. So there are Modelica libraries but also technologies for model predictive control, in particular the Bob test uh, development. And task two is uh, focusing on data models, both at the city scale, but also at the billing scale. So uh, city GML, for example, and uh, IFC as uh, some candidates. And task three is focusing on application and dissemination. So we are collecting uh, applications that you can see on the project one website. We're also developing a validation test, so similar then or inspired by best tests, but now focusing on district energy systems. So that's a test test, yeah, as we are calling it. Where we really want to see of uh, where those different approaches differ from each other, and if someone develops a district energy system, whether they really can represent similar results than some reference simulation. Because there's a lot of different assumptions in those district energy system simulation. It's not always clear a priori of what physical phenomena are in, uh, included in those simulations. So we want to get some clarity about that to really understand how to best uh, simulate that and then give the users information about the accuracy of those tools. So we're having three levels of participation here. So we have sponsoring participants, and I'd like to thank, uh, express my thank here to NG Lab and also Mitsubishi Electric, who are providing a cash contribution that allowed us then to invite particularly students to participate on those international meetings. Because in some cases, and also in my case personally, I think from a career point of view, I was very formed and I was able to participate in an international energy agency project. So it was task 22, and that really set then the track of my future research. And hopefully we can give something from that further to the next generation of uh, energy modelers and tool developers through this uh, sponsorship. We also have organizational participants. So they typically uh, commit to about at least a half uh, full-time employee per year over the duration of the full projects. And then there are individual participants. So we do not want to fill up the barriers as it is, for example, done in international energy agents projects where one has to have a minimum level of commitments and then get the okay from a counter representative. So we, if someone can make contributions to the project, we want to make it easy for them to contribute here as long as they are really substantial contributions. So we don't want to encourage tourists who are just attending the meetings, but really if someone has contributions they want to do, we welcome them and try to integrate it in our work. In terms of IP, and that was really critical when we get, got started with the Annex 60 and then we see a project one, is that we have a clear holder of the copyright and the license. But everything that we are doing, with no exceptions, is open accessible to anyone. And all the software is developed under the three-class BSD license, which, which essentially says that while a website is the copyright and license holders, anyone can take this technology and integrate it into their tools, adapt it to their tools at no cost, as long as they make some acknowledgement that there's technology from the Avipsa project one included. So let me switch to explain some selected work from the Abipsa project one, and then also explain how that's being used in uh, uh, projects in the US. So around 2013, uh, development of Modelica libraries was very fragmented. So we, while we used all the same language, all those libraries were uh, mutually incompatible with each other because we used different conventions 
different uh, connectors in some cases of that allowed uh, connecting different models with each other. And we didn't really understand, understood best practices. So at that point, uh, some of those libraries were actually uh, proprietary, so close to us. So it really took some effort then to and, uh, get, get all of us in a room and said, let's just open source everything that we are doing and try to uh, converge and agree on common principles of how to represent those models, what are best practice, test them out across uh, systems that we all have in our libraries and converge to a way that allows us then to do a robust implementation of those models. So that led then to what's called the Modelica Ibipsa library. So it's a core of a library that's now shared by all those four libraries in a way where we basically uh, develop jointly this Ibipsa library. And then through uh, scripts, we automatically merge that into our libraries so that the end user will only need to download any of these four libraries and they got everything uh, included that has been developed through the Ibipsa project one for this Modelica development. So developers would typically then work either on the Abipsa library or any of these four other libraries where we add, for example, system models, certain components that we have not moved into the Abipsa library, but also documentation specific for our users. And then uh, uh, practitioners, they would use either directly libraries like the Modelica Billings library or tools that implement those libraries, like Spawn of Energy Plus that we are developing or Urban Up that also uh, starts uh, uh, supporting uh, Modelica models from the Billings Library. So the Modelica Billings Library evolved now within those uh, 10 years of collaboration under the ANIT 60 and the Project One to, to be what's probably the biggest Modelica library that's uh, out there. So it has more than 2,000 validated uh, free and open source models and uh, functions for our application domains, so for uh, air based systems. We have uh, hyphonic systems. We can do, for example, uh, multi zone air exchange, so similar than what you would find in Quantum or Commis in, in those tools. We also have a multi zone uh, 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 heat and uh, moisture transfer models. We have a coupling of a CFD uh, tools. We can also model electrical systems together with the thermal system. So we can see what's the effect on the DC system, AC system. So either two-phase, three-phase, balanced or unbalanced systems and integrate those systems graphically to look at these interactions. So scalability in terms of the billing envelope simulation has always been a problem so far in Modelica. Uh, but at the same time, Energy Plus is also being developed by the US Department of Energy and Energy Plus has a very strong envelope model, but it's difficult to integrate Energy Plus into a control delivery workflow and to simulate certain novel systems. So there's basically areas where Modelica shines and other areas where Energy Plus has a very big strengths. So we got together and uh, designed then how we can integrate those two tools together in a seamless way so they are, that they are integrated automatically for the end user. And the uh, approach that we have been doing is such that we are pulling out uh, from uh, Energy Plus envelope model, loads models and lighting model, package that automatically behind the scene as a functional mockup unit. And then when we uh, translate the model and start the simulation, we automatically link this functional mockup unit to do a co-simulation between uh, HVAC systems, controls, and then the Energy Plus for all the heat transfers for windows, walls, and also do some for some load calculations. We also workflows then to export, for example, control models on the billing control systems. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, soon. And we are working to uh, develop uh, not only uh, open source translation tools, uh, such as Open uh, Modelica, but also work on uh, setup that allows then users of Spawn of Energy Plus to use the commercial Optimica compiler and no cost to the end user so that you can have uh, different uh, simulation environments, including commercial ones, without uh, the cost that's associated with uh, some of those tools. So from an end user point of view, a very simple model looks like that now, where we have on the bottom now a control sequence that's implemented in a subset of Modelica that we call a control description language. So we have, for example, a, a step function here 
or for the uh, set point and the PI controller and some gain that sets the temperature that should be leaving uh, this uh, heating device here. Then we have a very simple HVAC system here where we have a fan and a heater and that's then connected graphically to a room model. And this room model behind the scene will then automatically uh, create a function mockup unit that contains all the elements that's needed from energy plus and set up a co-simulation and synchronizes then the modelica simulation together with the energy plus uh, simulation. For a more complex case uh, that may look like this one here, where in uh, light orange on the top left, we have the implementation of the control logic according to ASHRAE guidelines 36. Then in yellow is the, are the models for the central air handler unit. On the right hand side, we have a VAV distribution terminal boxes. And on the top right, we have a five zone model that is a representative for the DOE uh, uh, commercial building uh, prototype model. So you can graphically combine those models and we are working now on uh, templates or platforms of those models that can then be easily customized by the user to select different HVAC systems, select our controls, and it will automatically then create those uh, uh, templates that can be used for simulation. So where we are now at the point where we can start simulating actual control sequences together with HVAC system and energy plus in the loop, we still have the uh, problem here of how do we make this press practice control widely available to the building industry and really bridge the gap between modeling and simulation to bring those uh, modeling and uh, operation of the building to bring those simulation models to actual operation of buildings and uh, uh, one driver for that is a, a survey that has been done about 20 years ago that showed that control related problems, if you look at all the different uh, root causes, that programming error is the most frequent source of uh, problems in commercial building controls. So we really want to make sure that we can implement those control sequences without any programming errors, test them in simulation and automatically translate them to building automation systems. So in some part of that uh, building on top of this development that we have been doing over the last uh, uh, eight or 10 years in uh, Annex 60 and that is project one, we are working now on libraries where we can package a uh, control sequence such as from ASHRAE standard, uh, uh, ASHRAE guidelines 36, make them available to designers so they can optionally test the performance with an energy model in the loop and then export them in an intermediate format that's independent of any control providers. And then a control uh, provider can bid on the project. And once they are selected, they can develop tools that translate this representation into the actual building automation system. And the uh, commissioning agent would then get the digital twin that we exported from the design specification and can use that to test whether the implemented control logic on the actual building provides the same response as the digital twin. And if we get different control actions or set points for the same sensor inputs, then something is wrong in the implementation and we can basically start then uh, turning that back to the control provider to fix those uh, implementation errors. So a key gap that we are addressing here with this uh, control description language that we are using to express the control logic is uh, shown here. So ASHRAE developed, for example, standard for data communication. So that's standard 135 of BACnet. There's also standards in development for semantic modeling. So standard 2 to 3P. And ASHRAE developed a PDF for Word document that describes how to implement control sequences for commercial buildings. So that's guidance 36. But what's really missing is a language that allows us to express this control logic in a vendor independent format so that we can use it for simulation, but also translate it to native implementation on specific commercial building automation systems. And that's what we are addressing now with the standard that we started uh, last year, the ASHRAE standard 231P or also called control description language. So we did a prototype uh, a translation of such a control sequence. And what you see on the left-hand side is an implementation of a terminal unit box uh, control of our variable air volume flow system. So that's the implementation using the subset of Modelica that we uh, call the control description language. And you see, for example, on top left, the two PI controller, and then this below is an active air flow set point uh, controller. 
And we developed the workflow and associated software where we did a prototype translation from this Modelica representation directly to web control from automated logic. So on the right hand side, you see now exactly the same sequence, but through machine to machine translations, we generated this implementation natively in web control. So you again see on the top left, the two PI controller, and then below the active airflow set point controller, and then a controller for the damper on valves. And those controllers are hierarchically composed the same way as they are composed in the control description language. And this workflow and this intermediate exchange format is something that we are now standardizing through the ASHRAE standard 231P to hopefully be able to then to deploy those control sequences in a robust way to the industry and be able to share best practice controls, not only in simulation, but also with uh, control providers. And in the future, hopefully with standards and with guidelines, like, like guidelines 36. So CDL will then allow a translation from those control sequences to existing control product lines via a JSON intermediate format that we are standardizing now. So that will then translate it to existing control product lines but the next generation control product lines or also digital twin offerings can directly use all the technology that is being developed within the Modelica community because CDL is a proper subset of Modelica, it's a very small subset of it. We can use, for example, a technology that comes out of the FMI standardization or EFMI that is uh, specifically developed to uh, generate code that uh, runs on uh, 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 industrial controllers. So you can use that to deploy control sequences or even a physical model that works as a digital twin. So there are some robust standards that are used, for example, in uh, heavily in automotive industry. And I think we can leverage that also for building industry because we are building on top of those standards. So let me switch gear here and uh, talk about the Bob test. So Bob test is basically a uh, uh, testing framework for billing uh, uh, control sequences. And it addresses the question that if you have different uh, control offerings, like for example, Ashray, who provides uh, rule based controls, like uh, publishing guidelines 36, or if you have an offering that may have more predictive control, as you see in the middle, or some other offering that uses machine based learning, you really want to understand how do these different control uh, approaches perform. Uh, against each other on the same set of buildings. So typically as a researcher, we don't really know which one is how much better for a certain set of buildings because we all use our own emulators or our own buildings. We use different uh, weather data to test those controllers. So it's very hard, if not impossible, to make a scientific judgment to uh, see which approach works uh, better in, in what uh, in, uh, conditions. And also from a user point of view or from a utility point of view, if you want to subsidize as uh, purchase or subsidize one of these controllers, you don't really know which one to select because we all have our own benchmarks and so Bob test, we want to unify that. So if you buy, buy for example, a window in Europe and uh, so, so similar efforts in the US, you get this uh, uh, energy uh, labeling scheme here. So you can see, for example, which climate zone you're in and then how well does your window perform for this given climate zone. But for controls, we have no feedback and no measure of really saying how good certain controls offerings are. So what we are working on Bob test is to create such a framework here. So we are working on uh, building an online repository of virtual test cases that are packaged as a functional mockup unit. And then a control provider can come with this with uh, controller, couple that uh, via web API, and test then the performance of this controller based on standardized uh, emulators. And this emulator allow them to override set points and also uh, actuator signals at different levels. So you can either override a supervisory control or you can select to override uh, even actuator signals and you can get practical measurement data out of these emulators and use them in your control offering. So that allows us then to start benchmarking different control approaches for certain buildings and see which approach works best. And as a research community, we can then drive the development of the most promising approaches. 
And if we are putting that one step further in the future, we could envision to start having a ranking that actually shows that this type of control approaches works that much better on those particular buildings in this climate zone than another approach. So now we can make informed decision to see what technology really works best for certain building usage or for certain climate conditions and really drive the industry or the control approaches toward the most promising approaches. So now we basically start understanding uh, how to transform uh, uh, models from simulation to controllers. We are also building infrastructure to test, for example, how good controllers are if part of an actual billing system. But we still have challenges here in terms of how do we now build systems that uh, decarbonize the building uh, energy consumption at scale, especially at the scale that's really needed to address climate change. And how can we create customizable platforms that allows us to reuse promising design, manage all this complexity and embody them in uh, template designs that is reusable. And why that's important is shown in this slide here, or sketched at least, that shows basically the uh, CO2 emissions here from the building sectors. And you see here that uh, all of a sudden we have a, a, a bend here in terms of where we need to be with the emission, in particular also with the indirect emissions. And we really need to have technology that's, that accelerate the decarbonization. Because whenever you see a curve that suddenly dips down in the prediction, it's either needs a fundamental change in technology and acceleration of the deployment, or it needs magic. And I don't really believe that we should trust on magic here. So we should really figure out what kind of technology can we develop to decarbonize building at the scale needed to address climate change. And stepping back for a moment, so we do have, for example, uh, energy concepts that are being developed by mechanical designers. There are planning tools that allows to some degree to uh, assess them. Then there are uh, other approaches and uh, tools for control specification. And at some point we moved toward the operation of a building. So we have all these disjoint developments that really makes it very hard to scale up uh, good ideas for how to control or how to build and control such buildings and roll that out at a large scale to the industry. So we really need to figure out how we can start integrating these different efforts with each other. And if you're looking, for example, at district energy systems, there are different generations of district energy systems. And on the heating side, their uh, temperature level has been succe successively reduced. And now with the first generation, also integration, for example, of CHP and waste heat and geothermal is becoming much more prominent. But we really have to ask ourselves, how do we decarbonize district uh, energy systems, in particular, the, decarbonize the provision of uh, heating. How do we add cooling? Because a lot of the uh, stress on cooling becomes much uh, more important, in particular with the recent heat waves. How do we add, for example, air, uh, low temperature waste heat, for example, from a sewage plant, or add storage in terms of geothermal fields, and also provide load flexibility to the grid? So the system is really, the need becomes much more complex. We have more requirements in terms of uh, grid flexibility, decarbonization, resilience, and we have more technology options to start integrating in those systems. So there are new system concepts for uh, combined district heating and cooling systems are emerging. And uh, in a review from a few years ago, uh, there was a collection to it that actually shows of uh, how, much, how many of those systems are being installed. So there's a slow increase of those systems, but certainly not at the rate needed to address climate change. And there's also a flurry then of different uh, hydraulic concept of those systems. So a while ago, there was uh, quite a few publications around the uh, so-called bidirectional uh, combined district heating and cooling system that looks very interesting from an exergy point of view, so from the thermodynamics, because they have a, a warm line and a cold line, and if the building is in the heating mode, it draws water from the warm line, boosts the temperature up to exactly what that building needs, and dumps then the cooler water back to the cold line. And similar, the chiller uh, would draw water from a cooler line, 
uh, boost the temperature uh, down to whatever is needed to cool that building, and the waste heat is being dumped into the warmer line. So from an exergy point of view, those systems are very interesting. But it turns out that not all hydraulic configurations are really operating in a stable way. So there were operating uh, challenges were reported uh, by uh, some of our uh, collaborators. And we were able with technology that we have been developing through the project one to actually reproduce those, uh, some of those problems and understand what's happening from the controls point of view. And using this insight, we were then able to design uh, other systems and judge how they are uh, suited in terms of their controllability and also their energy efficiency. So we did a comparison, for example, between uh, the those uh, bidirectional networks, which are called BN here, network BN, and the so-called reservoir network, where we have literally one pipe that moves uh, that is being laid around the district, and then every building is taking water from that pipe and dumps the waste heat or waste cool into the same pipe again. So from an exergy point of view, those systems are less optimal. And the question was really of how big is this uh, uh, deterioration of performance? So we uh, started building models here that uh, coupled then thermal heat flow, all the flow resistance calculation, which is very important because pumping energy can be big in those systems and the detailed control simulation. So we can start designing controllers. So we built up a system model that had about 7,000 equations and we built it up graphically. So it's uh, from using fairly high level declarations, we were able to build up a representative uh, neighborhood here, simulate the bidirectional network, and then we changed the piping layout to the reservoir network and energy consumption increased by about uh, 45 or 48 percentage. So next, uh, we improved in the pipe sizing. So using uh, economic consideration, we better sized the pipes and that brought down our energy consumption by considerably. And then through uh, better control of the main pump, we are able to bring down the energy consumption to the same level as we had for the bidirectional network. So that really showed us then through this rapid virtual prototyping and the capability that Modelica allows us to do a coupled energy simulation, fluid flow distribution, and control simulation, we could quickly uh, design such a new system that afterwards has a very good uh, control performance. So it's a stable operation, and it's almost as efficient as a thermodynamically uh, more optimized system. So what we are seeing here are now a new system concept for combined district heating and cooling system that also have uh, significant uh, uh, opportunities for renewable integration and also storage integration. But those systems become more and more complex. So what's shown here on the graph is a schematic diagram that was uh, shared with us from the integral group. And the question is really, how do we get a standardized solution for such systems? that ensure then that their implementation is quite by construction so that we don't need uh, some of the top engineers designing those systems for every single site, but we are interested in how can we create templates of them or platforms so that allows us to customize them to individual sites and roll them out. And it turns out that the uh, platform-based design is actually heavily used in various industries. So automotive industry is often using those platforms. For example, there are cars from Volkswagen, from Lamborghini and Porsche, that even though it's different companies, they share exactly the same chassis underneath. They'll revolutionize the platforms for computers, so you can customize what computer you want. And also for chip design, that would not be possible without those platform-based design approaches. So the question for us is really, how can we use such a methodology to manage complexity and allow design reuse? So how do we move from those uh, uh, energy concepts into uh, platforms of uh, system level solutions that can be customized to the particular site that may have a bar field or may have lake water cooling or may have PV or any other technologies embody those and share those templates in a library that can be used then by the designers to quickly 
uh, size those systems, assess the performance, and then in the future also integrate those systems into a digitized control delivery process. So once you're done with your design, that you can press the button and provide the whole control specification to a control uh, provider who can then translate that into their uh, control product offering. So questions are really, how do we go now from the strict energy system concept to actual implementation using some scalable workflows? So we are working, for example, with uh, NRL and with other partners on integration of data models with uh, urban opts and then integration in urban opts uh, of uh, energy models that allows us then to do the system level analysis of those uh, combined discrete heating and cooling systems. But in the future, we also need then to understand how can we make them more customizable through methodology, for example, like platform-based design and bridge in the gap to operation. So once we have this design, how can we export, for example, semantic model for that to bootstrap energy information system? Or how do we export also physics-based models that run as digital twin and can aid them in uh, optimizing the control to provide load flexibility or use those models, for example, for fault detection diagnostics uh, to identify system level faults at the system level rather than only at the component. So to realize that, uh, let me just uh, give some outlook now in the last part of this talk here. And to realize that we really need standardized technologies that enable such workflows. So modeling really benefits from formal languages. So I think the framework that we are needing to strive toward to is to have a very clear mathematics that we are using to express our models of physical components, controls, and the systems that are formed by combining them. And using languages that allow us to reason about the behavior of those systems and for example, the runtime uh, performance. And we also need to have standards that allows us to build platforms that uh, allow us then to reuse different design solutions, customize them, and to that rapidly deploy best practice to the building industry. And we need to have abstractions so that compilers can generate specialization. For example, if you use now one of these platforms and do an energy simulation over here, you may typically generate different code than if you uh, take part of this model and want to run it as a digital twin during the operation of a building. And let's just look uh, what other industries are doing here. And for example, the automotive industry and associated industry like uh, aerospace, they invest heavily in uh, uh, how to transfer models from design to be able to run them as part of uh, those uh, uh, technologies. For example, in uh, automotive, they're interested in how do you run a physics-based model as part of the controller in an embedded system. And there was a development of the EFMI standards that allows then on one side to use a model, simulate the behavior in what's called the EFMU, test, for example, how to control that best, and then when you get to the next step of the, where you want to run those models as part of an embedded system, you go a different compilation path. So you can transform those equations and write algorithmic code in a language that's called Galec, expose that also with an XML manifest. So you can generate code that has certain runtime properties like memory management. You are sure that there are no floating point evaluations. You have predictable computing time. And then at the very end, you can translate the uh, code for your particular target platform, whether that's actually a, a reasonable uh, a computing infrastructure or whether it's just a, a cheap embedded uh, hardware. So we really need to understand how we can decouple those model representation, use standards so that we can build on and reuse some of those technologies and apply them to the building industry. And while this one has been going down deep into the individual components, there's also standards like uh, system structure and parameterization that allows them to use these components and build, again, systems so that you can have a, a code from for embedded controllers, for example, from one provider, part of the physics-based uh, simulation from another provider, and there may be other parts of the physics that may be represented in a different simulator, and the system structure parameterization standardizes then how you can use these components and build up whole systems again in a simulation agnostic way. 
So this uh, standard is then being supported by different tool vendors that allow them to integrate those components and provide analysis framework using those uh, reusable uh, uh, individual agents that are then implemented and shared uh, within those systems. So just to close, I wanna stress here that developing those integrated tool chains really requires a continuous international collaboration. So there are a lot of uh, standards being developed, for example, for communication, there are simulation optimization engines developed, there's a digitized workflow for design and operation of buildings, and there's also semantic data models being developed and also other data representation. But we really need to understand and uh, work within uh, open communities so that we can start integrating all these different aspects, building on top of standards so we are not reinventing the wheel and provide through the standard and robustness to industry so that the building industry can start adopting them, invest into these technologies and bring those modern approaches to actual operation of a building and to that uh, address the, the overarching goal of how do we decarbonize the building stock, how do we provide resilient, build, resilient buildings and how do we provide great flexibility to the electrical grid. So with that, I would like to open up for any questions and discussions. All right, well, thank you very much, Michael. This has been a very interesting presentation and I want to invite uh, you know, anyone who's been watching this to type their questions into the chat window uh, so that we can uh, pose those questions to Michael. Uh, while we're giving everyone a chance to type in their questions, I wanna start out with a question of my own. Um, it's clear that this functional mock-up uh, interface allows, um, allows us to program uh, control systems that mirror real control systems very closely and that could be integrated into real buildings. Um, have there been any I know, uh, studies or investigations that look at how, um, how that performs in existing buildings? And, and is there potentially a way to create uh, systems with artificial intelligence that can learn uh, using that system? Uh, yes, that's uh, two somewhat separate questions. So for existing buildings and also existing control product lines, what we are working on is uh, shown on the, let me go back here, this approach here. So from this uh, control description language, we are working on uh, a JSON intermediate format to so ASHRAE standard 231P that then will allow the control providers to translate that into their native product offering so that the Siemens and the Honeywell and the Johnson Control and the ALC does not have to rewrite the whole control product line because that would likely uh, ten, take 10 or 20 years. It may never happen in some cases. So we want to be able to map those controllers that we use in simulation to a format that can then be uploaded to actual building automation systems, and then they look exactly the same and they run exactly the same as manually programmed controllers on that platform. But then for new generation control product lines, the way I would do it today would be to natively support the CDL and generate, for example, a EFMI and run that directly on, on those embedded computers. So the over top level format allows for both workflows. So we are not constraining uh, one or the other approach. We wanna address also the existing control product line. So we don't have to wait 10 or 20 years because we just don't have time for that in view of climate change. But at the same time, we wanna allow it then also for new uh, product lines to go the other path. So now for uh, machine learning and all other, uh, more, let's say more sophisticated methods, you can certainly go the second path here but you can also combine them. So you could envision, for example, that an existing control product line has an input output block that then imports a functional mockup unit and interacts them. Because at the end, the functional mockup unit is essentially just the input output block where you have predefined input, predefined output, and then you have functions to send set inputs to do a time step and to get the output. So it's a very simple abstract interface that can then be used to extend, for example, existing control product line and so that bridge the gap then to those more sophisticated methods. And some of the FMI methods, they are uh, supported by, I think it's uh, 
more than 150 tools now who support FMA. There's also some, other, some tools like Julia who can export the function mockup unit. So you could do machine learning in Julia, export that as a function mockup unit, and then start integrating with that. And we, we did about 10 years ago for Tritium Niagara a prototype implementation that actually showed that you can run a function mockup unit as part of uh, those uh, control systems. Right, thanks. Here's a question coming in from YouTube. Um, this is a question about uh, converting from BIM to BEM. Um, so does, does the system, does IBEPSA Project 1 help us convert from BIM to BEM? Uh, this individual technology has been developed, so that's mainly done by uh, our German collaborators who had significant funding in that, so Aachen University and uh, KIT. They have been uh, influencing them and also had driving the building smart standard. There was some development happened then in integration of those some translators from BIM to uh, Modelica and the approach there is to provide that through uh, tool offerings then that provide BIM technology. So for the details of that, uh, Christoph Fundwerk, who is the co-agent of this project, he's uh, probably best suited if you have a specific question here about that. We, we do have uh, quite an extensive description of that in the Annex 60 final report that you can download from the Annex 60 web page. But the approach there is really to provide those individual uh, tools for translation, for geometry simplification, for example, and then work with uh, tool developers to bring that into those uh, uh, product offerings. All right. Thank you. Here, here's another question. Um, this is about the BOP test emulator. Uh, it essentially allows developers to test controls on different virtual buildings. Um, what about testing under different virtual weather conditions or different uh, climate change scenarios? Yeah, so some of these emulators are in different uh, weather zones. So there, there are different climates in, in those emulators. There's also, not regarding to climate change, but there's also work ongoing now in uh, having uncertainty on weather predictions that can affect the performance of modulative control algorithm. All these emulators, they are open, available, open source. So the modelic implementation and also the whole tool chain to integrate them into Bob test is open, available. So you can uh, take these emulators and change the weather file if you want to and use, for example, a future weather data. We are working here uh, kind of a trade-off between having a lot of different emulators with all different bells and whistles and have a limited number of emulators. And why it's important for us to focus on a somewhat limited but representative number of emulators is that if you wanna start comparing the performance of your controller against other controllers, it's important that we don't have hundreds or a few hundreds of these emulators because then it's very unlikely that someone else used the same emulator. So what we want to work toward this Bob test is have this set of emulators then allow researchers and also uh, companies to test their controller, publish their results. And then if you go in and you, if you develop your own advanced controller, you can hopefully in, in a few years, you can see five or 10 other controllers that have been developed and tested on that uh, emulator. And you can see how good is your controller now? Are you best in class there? Or are you way behind the state of the art? Or are you good in energy savings, but bad in terms of maintaining thermal comfort? So we wanna be able to really build up a set of results that allow you then to benchmark of how good you are doing with your controller. Use that to drive the further development of your controller and then also publish and contribute your results to that set of benchmark with, uh, problems. But everything is open source available, so you can go in and modify these emulators as you what wish to. Okay. Uh, here's a question coming in from YouTube. Uh, is there a tool to author IDF files for Spawn uh, or a way to convert the regular Energy Plus IDF file so that it can be used in Spawn? Yeah, so you can use the regular IDF file for Spawn. So what happens when you use them with Spawn is that uh, those files are being read and then all the HVAC systems are basically removed from the IDF file and the internal heat gains, constructions and the thermal zones, for example, they are retained in the file. So we are basically stripping out all the HVAC system because those are modeled then in 
Modelle gehabt. Hat auch darauf checks like Thomas Owens und EMS Actuators uh, are all uh, left in there. So we can start writing to uh, EMS Actuators. We can get any output variable from Energy Plus and then use all the zones together with their internal heat gains uh, as part of, and external heat gains for Windows as part of this uh, combined simulation. So you basically use an existing IDF file, have then a, a, a zones in Modelica for every uh, zone that you want to uh, get from the IDF file, and then add the HVAC system in Modelica in order to control that building. All right, thank you. And actually, I have a, a follow up to that question. Mm -hmm. uh, for people who have you know, learned uh, using Energy Plus, uh, how difficult do you foresee the transition um, to using Spawn or to you know, using an FMI um, you know, implementation? It, is, do you have to relearn a lot or do you retain a lot of the same um, tools and knowledge going from one to the other? Yeah, so FMI is something you don't really see if, unless you really dig in into the, the software. So that's just the, the format behind the scenes that we are using. In terms of model authoring, so we are working now on templates uh, for HVAC systems, for chiller plant, boiler plants, and also controls that will then so uh, uh, control sequence selection and HVAC selection tool allow you to select a certain HVAC system, configure them, so uh, essentially pull down menu, and to that then generate models for spawn of energy plus. We still need to do some more work in how to couple them, all those uh, individual systems easy together. You probably, uh, at, in the initial phase, you certainly need to open them up in a Modelica editor, but then you basically see icons and these uh, connectors, so you draw lines between them in order to connect them together and do a simulation. So at the end, if you want to start customizing some of those models or build your own models, you typically need training as you need also for Energy Plus or for Transys. Uh, for drag and drop of those HVAC systems, that aspect is based on users that we had and also some that we trained, it seems to be easier than some of the other simulation software. But I'm gonna say that uh, scaling them up to very large systems, let's see the bottleneck that we are working on now with the tool developers and also debugging of those models needs some different approaches here. That again, with training, we, we, can, we can address that. Typically, most people don't really go to the level where they start implementing own uh, simulation models. So that would again require a separate uh, part of education as it does if you wanna implement, for example, Energy Plus, uh, uh, a model or if you want to implement a transit type. So we have these different levels, I think, where training is needed and where most people really struggle the way we, we see it is not so much in how to use the tool, but uh, they don't really understand exactly what kind of HVAC system they want to model and how to control it. So at this stage of the development, for most of the HVAC systems, you also need to implement your controls with all the PI control loop and uh, the switches, etc. And that's often a skill that a lot of energy models simply don't have because they were never trained in that. We are working on templates now for this control to basically get over that uh, bottleneck so that you can use pre-configured and pre-tested controls. But that's something that we you really need training in terms of how to implement control how to create HVAC systems. And then the simulation aspect is uh, not that hard from our uh, experience, for, but there are some scalability issues that we are still working on. Here's a question coming in from uh, Shadi on uh, YouTube. Uh, and this is a question about uh, energy flexibility. Um, so she says, in architectural design, the closest application of control seems to be climate adaptive facades. Uh, can you provide uh, feedback on how to how you can design or how design can be integrated into the big picture? Um, so this, this is um, making controllable uh, parts of the architecture as opposed to mechanical systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very open-ended question, but for example, if you as a architectural engineer is designing a facade, you could simulate that, for example, in uh, Energy Plus, 
Then the question is always how you control this facade. So you probably have to develop at some point a controller and that's where Spawn of Energy Plus can help you that you can develop your controller then in Modelica. Uh, use that to override, for example, EMS activators that are then used to control your facade in Energy Plus. And from Energy Plus, you can get, for example, outdoor temperature, wind speed, room air temperature, uh, solar radiation, all these quantities you can get at every time step back into Modelica and use that as an input to your controller. When you're done with that, you can basically test the controller, whether it's uh, robust and provides the, the performance and robustness. Uh, that, that you need. And once you get to that stage, you could basically use that uh, controller and then generate code that directly runs in an embedded computer. So I think that workflow gets in significantly simpler because you have the, the same semantics as you would have in a real control system. So you can do a direct uh, integration then of this uh, design workflow these operational tools and generate diff code in different ways. So either via an FMI or you can generate C code or use this EFMI standard. So different approaches that you can go today already with today's tools. Um, and here's, here's a very practical question coming in from Zulfikar. Uh, how many of the tools needed to design a control system are free and which ones need to be purchased? And I guess maybe an extension of that would be you know, have we reached a point where you can design an entire building, uh, you know, without using proprietary tools? Uh, yeah, no quite there yet. So for Modelica, you basically want two aspects. So it's a, a, a graphical editor and also simulation environment that does the translation and simulation. So, so far there is a, an open, source Modelica implementation called Open Modelica that does not cover everything from our uh, billings library yet, but we do work with them together. So we have a joint project and we anticipate by uh, the coming February that all the models in the billings library will translate in Open Modelica. And then we can see in terms of simulation performance if there are any bottlenecks for those. In the meantime, uh, you will need to have a, a commercial implementation and there are different offerings. So from uh, Modelon, for example, Impact is a web-based solution. Dasso System has a web-based and a desktop solution. Wolfram Research has also a solution that we haven't tested with our library and also MapleSoft. So there are different product offerings on the commercial side. We do work on the open source tools, but they are not yet uh, at that point where you can use them. For simulation purposes, we are also working now on distributing then the Optimica compiler at no cost for the end user. So that's the compiler that is developed by uh, Modelon and that's used by the Impact, uh, which is a web-based uh, offering for uh, modeling, uh, uh, models in Modelica using drag and drop. And then behind the scenes, you have the simulation backend using uh, Optimica. That's also in their web offering and we, we are able to distribute them and for spawn of energy plus uh, no cost to the end user, but that's still work in progress. So in the meantime, you, you would have to get one of these commercial uh, tool offerings. And you also pay for Microsoft Word and all those, so yeah. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, and here's one more question coming from Chris. Um, the examples shown supplant all of the air and water side energy plus functionality. Is it practical to work without throwing so much of this energy plus functionality away? Um, uh, we are talking about that. So it may be possible in the future developments to keep certain zones controlled by energy plus, but what we can't really do practically is integrating Modelica HVAC system with energy plus HVAC systems. In particular, in a way that at, at the end, the user will understand what's going on. So Energy Plus has a very different methodology because it's low based and essentially a room is simulating how much heat it needs or cooling in terms of how many watts it needs to meet the set point. And this request is then sent to the HVAC uh, simulation manager that then does a simulation iterates among the components to see how much flow need to be provided in order to meet the set point. Or if we can't meet the set point, it does a, a, a second simulation to see how much it deviates from that. So it's really low based. Where input into the HVAC simulation is how many watts you have, uh, you require. 
and then the output is how many watts you, you provide there or how much mass flow and temperature you provide. In Modelica, the approach is uh, modeled based on what happens in real physics. So you have a sensor signal that measures the temperature and that the sensor signal becomes input into a control sequence that then uh, computes, for example, a position of an air damper or a position of a, a valve for a cooling coil. And then based on the actual pressure drop distribution in that flow network, uh, it will decide how much flow will this uh, valve or this room get. And based on that, you get uh, an evolution of the room temperature. So it's, Modelica is basically close to and true of how actual control systems are being uh, simulated and energy plus is for various reasons in terms of computational efficiency and also usability and ease of configuration based on this loaf based approach that is semantically completely different from uh, the, the modelic approach. It will be very hard to combine them. And I don't really see right now a path forward for combining them, except in a way that would probably be very convoluted and maybe only a handful of people would know how to use it. So that's why we decided that once you control a thermal zone and connect it to energy plus, uh, so connected to Modelica, we are going to rip out the HVAC system in uh, energy plus for that part of the building. So it's really clear and understandable what's happening when you start connecting those two. What we can still do in, in the energy plus side is you can Override time scanners, for example, for internal loads, override uh, actor, EMS actuators, for example, for shading devices, and then get all the output variables from Energy Plus to use them in controls for on the Modelica side. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. And thank you to everyone who's joined us for this IBIPSA USA Research Committee webinar. If you enjoyed this webinar, please consider joining the IBIPSA USA Research Committee. Email research at ibipsa.us or visit the link in the chat window for more information. For those of you watching us on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please join us again on October 28th at 10 a.m. Pacific time when Sandeep Jadav and Praveen Kumar present large scale modeling of wind comfort and safety using the pedestrian comfort analysis app. Thank you everyone.